So what can we do with an SR flip-flop? Really, this first half of Chapter 6, we're trying to talk about the flip-flops, and then in the second half, talk about what we do with them. But right now, we're just going to take a break and talk about debouncing. Debouncing is a huge topic. You can see here in this list of documents associated with the lab section of this course, four Verilog circuits that have been made each debouncing in a slightly different way. So this is an introduction to a really thorny problem. What we're looking at is a switch. It's a single pole, double throw switch. This is a piece of metal. And when you flip the switch, this piece of metal flips, rotating around that pole, it flip from this throw to that throw. Now the characteristics of this, this switch are defined right here. Initially, it is connected to B. So we have 5 volts, well right here dropping down, but 5 volts mean being maintained here into our reset line. A is just floating in the air. Any little power that should not ideally be coming out of our SR flip-flop is being siphoned off down to ground. So this input to our set is going to be zero. And the reset's going to be a one. So our output's going to be zero and one. So our voltage is high initially because of the switch position right here. Now we undergo the situation of flipping the switch. We start off connected to B, so we push this metal bar up. It now is in Never Never Land in between A and B, connected to neither A nor B. And then it hits A, and it bounces. The, meta, the metal physically bounces on top of this throw. The throw is a piece of metal. This is a piece of metal, and they're bouncing on top of each other when you flip a switch. We can see then it connects to A, and once it connects to A, the very first time an SR flip-flop goes high, and then it stays high as we bounce, as it bounces around, and the Q bar stays low. So these bounces don't affect our output. This is the benefit of an SR flip-flop. Then we take A down, so we're leaving A, so this metal bar now is up here at A, now it's leaving A and going back towards B. So there's a little bit of gap in time while it's through the air. Then B begins to bounce. And then we go back to a reset position where Q is zero and Q bar is a one. In summary, we have to look at the voltage characteristics of a switch and then build a debouncing circuit. Here we see a S bar, R bar, or a not S, not R, latch. Instead of the word flip-flop, we're using the word latch. And it has a truth table that has the unpredictable behavior here in this row. Here's our remembering row. Here we're adding a third input. It has three names in this slide. It's called gated. This is the gate. It's also called an enable and obviously disable. Or it's called a clock. So we're heading towards this concept of a clock. But you can think of it as an enable. So when this is a one, it enables the SR flip-flop to work, and when it's a zero, it blocks it from working. So when the enable is a zero, it doesn't matter what S and R are. So these are basically don't cares in our inputs. And our circuit's just going to sit here and remember forever as long as the clock's zero. It's going to open its eyes and look at the inputs, change perhaps, and then shut its eyes and just remember. This is a 
D flip-flop or a data flip-flop. We take the S and the R and we combine them together into one input. We tie the two S and R together with a NOT gate. It creates this truth table. So it remembers the current state of D. Here, D is a zero. Our clock's a one, meaning look at the inputs. And if it sees a zero, it makes Q a zero. If it sees a one, it makes Q a one. And if we're not looking, it doesn't care what the value is on D. This is the most simple flip-flop. This is the one you want to design with. This one has no evil states, has only one input, so you can't worry about two inputs changing in which pattern or order they change in. And it creates the simplest design document. It doesn't always create the simplest circuit, the fastest circuit. It doesn't create the most energy efficient, cheapest cost circuit. But it makes the design process, the time you take designing the circuit, less. OK, so let's look at a D flip-flop. You can see I've picked one out right here. I'm dragging it over and I'm dropping it. I'm going to hook up the clock permanently. I'm going to make it uh, high level. And let's see if we can poke at it and get it to work. So it's following. The output here is following my input. If it's a 0, 0. If it's a 1, 1. Yeah. Now let's look at the timing of it. So I'm going to go up here to simulate and disable the simulation. I'm still in poke mode, so I'm going to poke a 1, and I'm going to press Control i 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's six little blue circles going through the D flip-flop. Let's make it 0 and see what the change is. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five or six. If we tell logicism to turn this into a circuit, then what does it build? Oh no. Yeah, we still have the same problem. Okay, we've been looking at blue circles going through chips, looking at delays. We need to get more sophisticated about this. What we're looking at here is a timing diagram for a SR flip-flop. And what we need to acknowledge is that things don't happen instantaneously. S right here doesn't go instantly high and doesn't come down instantly. These are our inputs. Right? It takes some finite amount of time to flip a switch, or even for a 1 or a 0 logically to get into a chip. Same thing is true with R. So we do have these times for a pulse to go from the definition of low to switch over to high. Everything between here and here is high. Everything between here and here is low, and there's probably some Neverland in here. And this is why you take discrete math, so you can begin to verbalize this in a more precise way. Here we have the time of a pulse to go from high to low. So here it's high and here it's turning low. And maybe these are at the same level and maybe they're not. Here we see a different time for a pulse to go from high to low. Maybe they're the same. Maybe they're not. Here we see a different time for a pulse to go from low to high from low to high. What is the event that we start triggering everything from? So this gets really complicated and messy, and it can ruin our circuits. Remember now, our goal is to run these circuits as fast as humanly possible. We're slipping into this world where we're beginning to talk about a clock. These, are, these issues then become a problem. If we slip into the world of talking about the brain, then we deal with these issues in a totally different way. That's in chapter nine. In this course, our goal is to ignore the rise and falling slopes 
in this way. You can see that we're saying, okay, here's our S, and this is a vertical line. This is why you've been writing on engineering paper. And we can see that Q is coming up a little bit later, and Q bar is coming up a little bit later. So the difference between this line and that line is a delay. And we are just going to stick in a delay. It doesn't matter what it is, what its value is on this, this timeline right here. And these timing diagrams are just going to stick in a little bit of a delay to show that this is causing this. This yellow event of S going high is causing our Q to go high and our Q bar to go low. So let's go through now and look at the rest of the detail here in this timing diagram. It looks like we have an event here where S is going low. Well, between here and here, what we have is remembering going on, right? The SR flip-flop is remembering that Q is high and Q bar is low. And then we have a new event here on our inputs where R is going high. So immediately what happens is Q goes low, well, a little bit later, not immediately, and Q bar goes high. Cool. And then a little bit later, what we have is our R going down, and we enter another remembering state. Now we're remembering that Q is zero and Q bar is high. Now we're going to start dealing with chaos. Here we have the exact same thing as right here. So we have the S going high, and then we have our Q bar go, Q going high and our Q bar going low. But our S doesn't come down until here. And our R goes up in the middle of all this. And we have that evil situation where S is high and R is high. So how do things respond? We look at this event of R going high. And we see that Q bar, Q bar stayed low and Q went low. So now they're both zero. R goes down low. And when R goes down low, right here, then the set takes over, the set dominates, and our Q responds by going high again, and we've got a normal situation where Q is low and Q bar is high. And then we go into a remembering situation. When S goes down low and R is down low, then we go into a remembering right here. But there was a dance with chaos in here. So let's look at a different dance with chaos. Here we're going to say, OK, reset goes high. All right, just immediately after reset goes high, Q goes low and Q bar goes high. So we're resetting back to zero. All right. And now reset staying high. And in the middle of reset staying high, S goes high. So we've got the evil situation, the same one as right here. The evil situation where S is high and R is high. Now the minute S goes high here, what we have is instead of our Q dropping down to zero, our Q is already zero in the middle of this, our Q bar drops down to zero, which is OK. Now we have zero, zero. And set gives up, reset wins, and reset gets to pull its Q bar up high again. Just like over here, when set won, it got to pull Q up. Well, here, reset gets to pull Q bar up. And then we have the situation where R goes down, and we have this remembering going on right in here. Remembering that Q bar is high and Q is low. OK, now we're getting into a really difficult situation. S is going high, and we have our Q bar going high, and our Q going low. That's what we would expect a little bit later in time. 
And then we have the evil situation of S and R both being high. And just like before over here, when S and R both high and Q is high, Q goes down right here. So Q goes down right here. And we have that crazy situation where they're both zero. But now we see the problem. Both S and Q drop at the same time. Two inputs change at the same time. Now you remember me bouncing on the table. You remember me hitting the table with my hands. We know that both of these things can't happen exactly at the same time. We've made an approximation by squaring all these corners and not having rises edge and falling edges to determine exactly what happens. And because of that approximation, because of that logical approximation, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if what could happen. Well, Q could go high because set won. Or Q bar could go high because R won. Here R won. Here set won. We don't know what's going to happen. So this situation right in here is unknown. It's unknown to our simulator. It's not unknown in reality. In reality, these falling lines right here are real, right? But they're going to be at the slope. And the slope and the definition of what is a pulse high and what is a pulse low is going to determine what happens. But our simulator doesn't know. They're both low right here. This is supposed to be a remembering situation, just like this is remembering, that was remembering, this is remembering, right? Both our S and our R are low, but they don't know what to remember. Our simulator doesn't know what to remember. This is all solved at S and make it a one, and then it goes, ah, I know what to do. I know to make Q high, and I know to make Q low. So this is called a timing diagram, and you're asking yourself, why am I doing this? Well, this is how you debug a circuit. This is what the instruments display on their screen. This is the data that you capture to prove that your circuit's working. This is the information you put in to your test and say, my circuit must behave this way to pass the test. 